my blood, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but of God. You're not born into a family and now you get that life. It has nothing to do with your roots. It's not something that another man can give to you. As a pastor, as much as I would love to, to just, just you know, give you a certificate and stamp a, stamp a form and say, okay, now you're saved. I cannot do that. I don't have the authority to do that. But Jesus does. He has that authority because he died on a cross and paid the price for sin. And that's why he could say, this is the New Testament in my blood, which is shed for you. This do in remembrance of me. Why? Because he provided that life from an eternal past and an eternal present. And so beginning in verse number 11, he says, this is the record that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Now note verse 12. He that hath the Son, that means you've received him, hath life. And he that hath not the Son, hath not life. You say, but I'm alive? You don't, you don't understand. You are physically alive, but you are spiritually dead until you receive Jesus. That's why the Bible tells us in verses like Ephesians 2, and you have he quickened who were dead in trespasses and sins. Until we receive Christ, we know nothing of life. To God, we're dead. To God, we just are existing. And we're going to live and die an eternal life will be out of our reach and out of our grasp. In verse 13, he writes, These things have I written unto you, that believe on the name of the Son of God, that's receiving Him, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. Now, I, I love the fact that we believe as Baptists in eternal security. And how anybody could read that text and not get excited is beyond me. How anybody could think that God would give us eternal life, which never ends, and take it back is beyond me. God doesn't do that. When he gives it, you become a child of God. That's why Jesus explained it differently. My, my dad last night used the text in, in John chapter 3 of Nicodemus. And, and Jesus, Jesus mentioned to him, you must be born again. And he said, how can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter the second time into his mother's womb? He was thinking physical life. Jesus was talking spiritual life. And he had no clue what he was talking about. And then Jesus explained, that which is born... Of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. First, he gives us life. Second, the Bible tells us he gives us light. In him was life, and then it says, and the life was the light of men. Verse 5, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God, his name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. That's, again, receiving him. As we receive him, he gives us light. Verse 8, he was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. Now note verse 9, that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Make no mistake about God. God gives light to every man. How we respond to that light and what we do with that light that we, we receive is our business because we have a choice. And God wanted us to respond to the light, and as soon as we receive Christ, the lights come on. 
We comprehend. We have understanding. That's why he said that the natural man, a man who is just, going, is just born and dies, a, a man who just exists, a man who has a body and a soul, but a dead spirit, that man will never see the light or come to the light until he receives Jesus Christ. And once he receives Christ, now he can understand all things. The Bible tells us that we have understanding because of Christ. He lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Verse 12, but as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. First, he gives us life. Second, as we receive him, we receive light. The lights come on and we receive understanding of everything about the Christian life. We see things from a totally different perspective. We actually now see things through God's perspective. We have, we, we're given the mind of Christ. What a privilege that we have. That we would be able to have the mind to be able to think like the Creator. The Word who preexisted. The opportunity to be able to enter into the wisdom and understanding, though it's through a glass darkly, because we're looking through the veil of our flesh, yet we're able to understand and comprehend things that the average person just looks at and says, that makes no sense to me at all. Well, the reason it makes no sense is because that person has never received Christ. We get life. We get light. And the last, and I think probably the most enjoyable of all, is love. I can't think of anything that describes love more than family. I, I don't know about you, I'm a big family man. It's part of the reason why tonight we're not going to do an evening service, because I, I want you to be with your family. And why we shifted Sunday night to Saturday night, so that way we'd be able to, it's not often that Christmas is on the weekend. I value family. Now, I, I, I do have, I try to have the balance of family and church. I think that you're, a great part of raising your family is having them in church. So, so, no, so make no mistake, I, I don't, I, if it's God or family, remember it's God. You say, well, well no. Well, Yeah. And, and God's, you know, when, when I say God, Jesus said, if you love father and mother more than me, what? You're not worthy of me. And so there's priority in relation to God. He is to have the preeminence, the Bible says. We just read it a minute ago. But I am big on family. So that's part of the reason why we, we are very careful not to over overdo things during the week. I try to understand the schedules of people and the time of people because I value my time with my family I, you know, because kids grow up. All my kids are grown now. My wife and I, you know, we, she's stuck with me now at home, okay? You know, so you, should pray, you need to pray for her, okay? <clears throat> because we're by ourselves. What's that? No, 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 I'm not, no, no, we're, I'm not even going to go. She, she wanted me to mention the dogs, and I don't even want to mention the dogs. Because if it was up to me, the front door would be left open, and they could go wherever they choose to go, okay? Um, but anyway, so she's stuck with me at home. And uh, God bless her, if something happens to me, then she can have the dogs, okay? She can, if, if she can exist with them, fine. Um, but, verse number 12 speaks of his love. It says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. That, that's incredible. That God would not only love us enough to die for our sins, but now to make us a part of his spiritual family. That is an incredible privilege. 
that is an opportunity of a lifetime. And why anybody wouldn't want to be a part of God's family is absolutely beyond me. Because there's no one that can love like God. No one. That's why John 3.16 has such power to it. For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him. And the wonder of, of God's love is He didn't exclude anyone. No one. He gave the opportunity for all of us to be a part of His family. Whosoever call, shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That's the wonder of this, the, the faith we call Christianity is because Christianity is open to the masses. It's open to the world. And though the world doesn't comprehend him sometimes, and the world didn't, didn't understand, didn't even know who he was, and though his own people rejected him and nailed him to a cross, he still died for them all. He died for those who don't want him. He died for those who did. He died for those who would reject him. He died for his own. And yet, people still don't grasp his love. The Bible says we love him because he first loved us. See, the, the difference in God's position and our position is, is He was the Creator. And so He established what He was going to do and how He was going to react prior to this world ever being created. And He could choose to do what He wanted to because He was God. So He chose to love all. He chose to die for all. And that is a different type of love than we understand. We're very, very selective, all of us are, in our love. It's, it's human nature. We, we don't always love those who don't love us. We don't, we all, we, we, we just, we, we just have a tr trouble with that because we're human. And we, we look at things that people do and, and we look at things that happen in our lives. And so we then reject people. God doesn't. God loved the world and he gave them a choice to reject or not to reject him. That's the choice. He will never force himself on anybody. The doctrines that have been purported that man has no choice, again, I, I've said it and I'll say it and I'll beat that drum until, uh, until I, I have no more breath, is absolutely senseless and ridiculous because God doesn't force anyone to be saved. He only wants you to open the door of your heart and let him in. And then he says, if you'll let me in, I will sup with you and you with me. That's family. Hey, not everybody comes and sits at, at my table. And not everybody comes and sits at yours. Your family is the one that's there all the time. And so to be a son of God and to be able to sit at his table one day when we get to heaven and enjoy that marriage supper of the Lamb and to be a part of all that is going on. You know, kids, they, they miss so much until they become a parent. Don't they? We don't, we, until we become parents, we don't fathom what our, par what our parents did. We just, you know, we, we, and we make silly statements like, you know, we, you don't know anything. <laughs> and then we get, we get married and we have our own kids and we realize that, wow, they really knew everything. <laughs> and we call them all the time. Parents put so much into providing for their children. That's part of family. And some kids get it earlier. Some kids get it later. 
the an understanding of what that really means. But it's no different with God. So many Christian people never really fully grasp and never really fully understand the magnitude of what God our Father did to provide the home, the family, the whole setting of eternity for us. The fact that Jesus would say, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Hallelujah! What a blessing! Now don't you think, now, now maybe you live in a nice home. But what if you're homeless? And you, heard, and you found Jesus and you know that one day you won't be homeless anymore, but you're going to be in a mansion in heaven. Think that would be appealing to you? You think that you'd be excited about that? We ought to be. We all ought to be, because what we are going to receive in heaven, compared to what we have, even as nice as it is, is going to be our, what we have, anything that we have in this life, is not anything compared to what we have in our future. Because God the Father, the creator of the universe, and the Word, the Son, also, because He was God, part of the creation has provided everything